We're now at the point of the evening that we've been eagerly awaiting the address by Cardinal Dole, and I would direct your attention. In the program, there's a more comprehensive biography of him. He was the rector of the North American College. He was a priest of the Archdiocese of St. Louis. He was there at the North American College from 1994 to 2001. Auxiliary Bishop in St. Louis for one year, 2001-2002. Archbishop of Milwaukee from 2002 to 2009. And on February 23rd, 2009, so just five years ago, he was named by Pope Benedict to be the Archbishop of New York. I remember the day very well because I heard the news at 6 29 in the morning, because I was in Ottawa and I was staying with Archbishop Prendergast. And if you stay with Archbishop Prendergast in Ottawa, if you don't have another Mass, and he doesn't have another Mass, you have to come for Mass at 6.30 in the morning, which as a university chaplain is not the usual time we have activities. <laughs> and so when there's Mass at the Archbishop's residence at 6.29, I arrive at 6, 6.30, I arrive at 6.29, by which time Archbishop Prendergast has been up, got himself ready, read the news, commented on his uh, blog, and arrived at Mass. And he said, when I came in, he said, Archbishop Dolan's going to New York. So that was five years ago. It's been a remarkable five years. For three of those years, he was president of the American, of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. And he's going to speak to us tonight about the mission on campus from the point of view of three popes. He was made a bishop by Pope John Paul II. He was named a cardinal by Pope Benedict XVI, and he was in the conclave last February that elected uh, our current Holy Father, Pope Francis. So I invite him now to address us on courage, clarity, and charity, three popes and the mission on campus. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's, that's fresh, okay, good, all right. There we go. I, I told you to put an olive in it. But <laughs> it will, felt, listen, everybody, thank you. Um, it's a real honor and a joy for me to be with you. I mentioned this evening when I was at the, um, at the Newman Center, when I had the privilege of offering Mass, uh, how I've been looking forward to this for quite a while. I know it was over a year and a half ago that uh, Father Raymond invited me, and I've been looking forward to it because I've heard so much about the good things going on here and uh, with Father Raymond and with the, uh, with the uh, Catholic Christian outreach and with everything going on at Newman and here in the church in Canada, here in the, uh, the Archdiocese of Kingston, the Archdiocese of, of Ottawa. So thank you so much for your welcome. I don't wanna, I don't wanna presume things, but you, I presume that you have made me feel very much at home and I appreciate that very much. I don't like to presume things. Archbishop Sheen taught us that. He told the story once about don't jump to conclusions and don't presume things. He was uh, counseling a, a woman who was having marriage difficulties. And she said, you know, my husband is a louse. He's awful. If you, if you could uh, come by and see him, I think he'd get better. So Monsignor Sheen at the time then said, fine. And he stopped into the apartment off Lexington and uh, 38th in New York. And as he knocked at the door, as, as uh, she opens up, sure enough, there's the husband laying on the couch, unshaven. This is about 11 in the morning, looking terrible, reading the newspaper. And he doesn't even get up. And he said, oh, hi, Monsignor Sheen. Um, he said, uh, tell me, what causes gout? And Monsignor Sheen said, ha, 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 I got this guy. This is a great opening. He said, I'll tell you what causes gout, young man. Staying out too late, drinking too much, chasing women, an unruly, undisciplined life, uh, that's what causes gout. Well, why do you ask? He said, well, I'm just reading here in the paper that Pope Pius XI has it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't like to jump to conclusions, folks, but I've already jumped to one this evening and that I feel very much at home, and that is due to your extraordinarily warm Welcome, so thank you very much. Father Raymond is correct. It was about five years ago uh, that I got the call from the Papal Nuncio at the time, Archbishop uh, Pietro Sambi. He said, uh, the Holy Father, Pope Benedict, uh, wants you to go to New York. And I said, uh, well, Your Excellency, I'm very honored, I'm very grateful, but I don't think 
I'm up to it. I don't think I have the competency and skill. I don't think I'm worthy to go. And he said, we know all that. But <laughs> we didn't ask you that. We just asked you to go, so please do. And I'm, I'm, glad, I, uh, I'm glad I did. I, I look out tonight. Um, what, what makes me particularly happy is to be in the company of Brother Archbishops, uh, Archbishop O'Brien and Archbishop Prendergast, to be in the company of Brother Priests and Deacons, uh, religious sisters, uh, particularly um, those I'm so proud of, our Sisters of Life from the Archdiocese, our students and uh, our, 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 uh, those in the apostolate of Catholic Community Outreach, our benefactors. Um, and uh, brothers and sisters in Christ who are here this evening, just to be in your company is a real inspiration. To see people who take their faith seriously, to see people who want to witness and, uh, and give testimony to that faith, on one, of the more, on one of the tougher climates that we got today, name, namely the campus of a secular university, boy, to see you do that and to do it so splendidly, that's an inspiration to me. One of the happinesses is, that I have when I get to go around uh, speaking is to see now uh, uh, functioning and exercising as such effective priests uh, the men that I was privileged to have in the seminary when I was rector of the North American College in Rome. And there's three of them here tonight, Father Brian Stitt, who's a wonderful parish priest and the director of vocations in the Diocese of Ogdensburg. Um, Father, Steffel, Father Mark Steffel is here, who's in graduate work at Canon Law in Ottawa. And of course, our own beloved uh, Father Raymond D'Souza, who does such a stellar job as pastor on Wolf Island in communications nationally and internationally for that matter and for the exemplary uh, work that he does as chaplain of the Newman Center on campus. You three priests, uh, I'm so very proud of you and you make it all worthwhile. So thank you, uh, Father Mark and Father Brian and Father Raymond. Thank you for making me, your old rector, so proud. I'm, I, thank you. And, I just got back from Rome yesterday. I had a big, a big benefit last night at the Waldorf Astoria in New York uh, to raise money for Catholic charities. We made two and a half million dollars. Not bad, huh? <laughs> and uh, tonight I'm honored here. Tomorrow I, I'm back tomorrow and I, and to New York and we got a big fundraiser for St. Patrick's Cathedral because we're doing repair, restoration and renewal at St. Patrick's. Um, St. Patrick's is a real icon, as you know. Uh, when I got there, uh, I had a luncheon for the uh, uh, ecumenical clergy, the, cl the clergy from around the city, uh, Jewish, uh, Orthodox, Christian. Uh, they all came in. And the Methodist, the Methodist pastor, who was pastor of Christ Church, Christ Church Methodist on Park Avenue, he, he was one of those that had to give me a, a toast. And he said, Archbishop Dolan, we welcome you to New York. But he said, I am very... Uh, angry at you and I'm very jealous of you. And I, I said, uh-oh, what's this about? We're off on the wrong foot. He said, I am pastor of Christ Church Methodist. And he said, uh, we had a, uh, a, do a benefactor that was going to come give me uh, $3 million. And he got in the uh, cab at uh, Penn Station and he said to the cabbie, take me to Christ Church. And the cabbie took him to St. Patrick's Cathedral. <laughs> And he said, the benefactor said, listen, cabbie, I asked you to take me to Christ Church. This is St. Patrick's. And the cabbie turned around and said, listen, buster, I don't know anything about religion. All I know here in New York, this is where Christ lives. So, uh, uh, Christ, Jesus Christ lives at the Newman Center on the, the campus here at uh, Queens University here here in uh, Kingston. And that's so evident to me, even though I've only been here about eight hours. And I thank you all for making that possible. Now, as Father Raymond said, what I thought I'd do this evening is try to speak for about 25 minutes or so on the last three popes, because I think these giants, John Paul II, Benedict XVI, and now our beloved Pope Francis, can teach us a great deal, and especially bring home some tried and true lessons for our campus life here and, and the Catholic students that are trying their best to live life as faithful Catholic disciples on campus. And what I thought I'd do, everybody, is speak in terms of soul, mind, and heart. Soul, mind, and heart. I'm going to propose to you that blessed soon-to-be Saint John Paul II uh, teaches a lot about the soul. 
Benedict XVI teaches us a lot about the mind, and Pope Francis teaches us a lot about the heart. Or to use the vocabulary that Father Raymond suggested, John Paul II teaches us a lot about courage that comes from his soul. Benedict teaches us a lot about clarity that comes from an extraordinarily sharp mind. And Francis teaches us a lot about charity that comes from a burning pastoral heart. So we got courage, we got clarity, we got charity, we got soul, mind, and heart, all right? So hear me out here and see if I make sense. Let's start with our beloved, blessed, soon-to-be Saint John Paul II. I propose to you that John Paul II, his tremendous contribution to the life of the church was the restoration of the soul, the primacy of the spiritual in the life of the church. When he visited the United States in 1979, when he went to the White House, then President Jimmy Carter introduced him as the soul of the world. Billy Graham, said of John Paul II, a providential prescription for humanity's exhausted soul. And Rab Rabbi Gilbert Rosenthal, a good friend of mine, when he, when he and a group of, of Jewish leaders went to see John Paul just months before he died, somebody said, this man, is, his body is gone. And Rabbi Rosenthal said, we're not going to see his body. We're going to look at his soul. John Paul II, folks, set as his mission the recovery of the primacy of the spiritual. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, as Jesus tells us in the gospel. Take care of the soul. Put the spiritual life first, John Paul would say to us, and everything else is going to be in its proper place. He himself, John Paul II, bordered on the mystical. You know what a mystic is. The mystic is one, rare indeed, who has periodic unity here on earth, with God, the kind of unity that we all look forward to in heaven. John Paul II was a mystic for those of us, and I know there are some in this room, I know Father Raymond, Father, Father, uh, uh, Father Brian, and Father Mark would have had the honor of, of attending his private mass in the morning, and his, you would go in about five minutes to seven, knowing that he had been at his pre for an hour, you would see him literally hypnotized, locked in prayer on his knees in his pre -do. If you were If you were blessed to be up close, you would hear him groan. You would hear him sigh. Periodically, you would see tears, all right? This was a man who was in touch with the divine. This was a man whose soul was burning with God's grace, who was literally a temple of the Holy Spirit. This was a pope who knew, as George Will said, who knew how to pope because of his strong interior spiritual life, because his soul was aflame with the Holy Spirit. Why? Well, some say that his own vivid spiritual life was perhaps a result of the high-octane Polish Catholicism in which he grew up. Some have speculated perhaps it's because John Paul, as Carol Wojtyla, lost everything. He lost everything he had. He was born in 1920 in post-World War I Poland that was still in the shambles of the First World War. He saw all of his family die. He could hardly remember his mother and sister. His, his brother and father died when he was yet in his uh, young 20s. Uh, he would himself describe September 1st, 1939, only 19 years old, as he looked up, as did all of Poland, and saw the Luftwaffe, the German aircraft, come in and take over Poland. He would see his friends disappear in the middle of the night. He'd see this, the brother seminarians with whom he was serving uh, morning mass. The next morning, he'd be the only one there because the seminarian had been uh, arrested. He himself hit by a truck filled with Nazi soldiers as he was coming home late at night from work in the chemical factory, left for dead. And then, when the war would end in 95, Poland would lose again. Poland having lost the, the war twice as the jackboots of Stalin and communism came in. No wonder, no wonder Karol Wojtyla would learn firsthand what the psalmist says, only in God is my soul at rest. No wonder Karol Wojtyla would know firsthand the saying of Jesus, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body, fear only those who can damage the soul. And no wonder, folks, his first words on October 16, 1979 were simply, be not afraid. 
be not afraid, to restore the exhausted interior life of the church's soul became the major goal of a pontificate that would last almost 17 years. And how did, excuse me, 27 years. How did he do it? By placing Jesus Christ at the center. Jesus Christ would become the center. As he would say, Jesus Christ is the answer posed by the question asked by every single human life. Placing Jesus Christ at the middle. Jesus Christ in the scriptures. Jesus Christ in prayer. Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. Jesus Christ in the sacraments. Jesus Christ in the arms of his mother. Jesus Christ in the poor. As Andre Frissard said a year after he was elected, when he wrote that masterful biography, he said, the world is saying, we have a pope from Poland. We don't. We have a pope from Palestine. And what this man is trying to do is return us to the year 30 AD when the whole church is walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, listening, learning, loving, and serving Jesus Christ. Now, it all came to a head, this restoration of the church's soul, not long after he was elected pope in June of 1979 in what have been called the nine days that changed the world. Henry Kissinger, in speaking to St. Joseph's Seminary in Dunwoody, New York, the seminary for the Archdiocese in New York, just a couple months ago said that John Paul II did for Poland in June of 1979 what Winston Churchill did for England during the Second World War, restored her soul. He galvanized the nation. And that word was born, the word that we call solidarity. Nine days that changed the world. Gorbachev would say it was the beginning of the end, meaning the end of the communist regime, the end of the Iron Curtain, when John Paul returned to his beloved Poland. Uh, what do we mean by solidarity? When John Paul was there, folks, and two-thirds of the nations lined the roads to see him pass, John Paul never once used the word communism. John Paul never once spoke about Russia. John Paul never once referred to the, to the hundreds of thousands of Russian bayonets that were lined up ready to crush whatever rebellion might take place because of his visit. No, he was simply there and he simply powerfully, dramatically reminded people of something that became a household word, namely solidarity. That all of Poland all of a sudden lifted up their head and said, we're not by ourselves. We're not alone. We're not a number. We're not a cog in a wheel. We have a name. We have a heritage. We have a culture. We have a destiny. We're not an animal. We're not a mere machine. We're not collectives like the communists think we are, but we're communities. We're not just a hollow body. We have a soul. We have faith. And and, and, remember the closing mass? Remember the closing mass? A million and a half people in Warsaw Square. And as John Paul begins to speak, it just started in one little, in one little corner of the square, do you remember? And the crowd gradually, gradually picked it up. It became a chant that echoed through the square, that echoed through Warsaw, that echoed through Poland, that echoed through Eastern and Central Europe, that echoed through the world. It became a, it became a chant of three words in Polish. It wasn't a chant, Russians go home. It wasn't a chant down with communism. Can you remember what the chant was? A million and a half people slowly, 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 before they're all on their feet shouting it out, we want God. We want God, a million and a half people. We want God. It went on for 30 seconds, a minute, a minute and a half, two minutes. John Paul simply stood and watched his master of ceremonies. Monsignor in a way came over and said, Holy Father, perhaps you should tell the crowd to be quiet so you can go on with your sermon. And he looked and smiled and he said, are you kidding? This is what I came for, all right? <laughs> a million and a half people. We want God. Solidarity is born. The soul is restored. When the archives of the KGB were opened after the fall of the, of the Berlin Wall, the KGB commander from Warsaw in the telegram that evening sent back to headquarters in Moscow saying, it's over. It's over. As a million and a half Poles shouted, we 
want God. This restoration of the spirit of the interior life was even, was even further enhanced as we watch John Paul II die in front of our eyes, as the world watched him die, and his weakness and frailty took over a man that we could remember to be hardy and to, to be athletic, uh, to be so strong and vigorous. When I was in Milwaukee, a young married couple came up to me after morning mass at St. John the Evangelist Cathedral, and they were on their way to Rome. They had just been married the night before. And I said, you want to, hey, you got your marriage license? I can, I'll call over and see, you can meet Pope John Paul II after the Wednesday audience. She was ecstatic. He wasn't that <laughs> much. He said, well, I was kind of hoping you could help us with restaurants. I said, hey, I can do that too, all right, but but let's make it work. So when they came back two weeks later, it was he who was ecstatic. And he said, did see John Paul II it was tremendous. I said, tell me what moved you at the audience, expecting maybe that he'd speak about the crowds or John Paul's linguistic ability. He said, I tell you what moved me. He said, we had great seats because of you. We could look right at the Pope. And when he started talking, he said after about 20 seconds, I saw John Paul reach into his pocket and take out his handkerchief and wipe his mouth because he was drooling. John Paul was drooling. The Pope was drooling. The Vicar of Christ was drooling. And he said, that I, he said, I found that to be amazingly moving, that in weakness, God's grace and strength was powerful. And John Paul, through his own suffering, the assassination attempt, remember? The Parkinson's, the cancer, the broken leg, the broken hip, the botched surgeries. John Paul's suffering helped restore, helped restore the, uh, the uh, uh, soul of the church. What can we learn here from John Paul's restoration of the soul? Of the soul? What can we learn here from the courage that John Paul uh, talks about our young people on campus and they're here this evening do you ever need courage now to lead a faithful Catholic life I've heard Father Raymond say to you you know on any campus these days you don't have to be embarrassed about doing uh, uh, debauchery or misbehaving on campus all right you don't have to be embarrassed about that at all that's acceptable you do have to hide, and sometimes you do have to sneak around to practice your faith because it's not chic. It's not popular. So we got a man like John Paul II who restores the soul of the church, who reminds us, be not afraid, who reminds us about the power of solidarity, who reminds us that God's grace is strongest in our weakness. That's what John Paul can teach us. Let's go on to Benedict XVI, can we? As John Paul touched the soul, Benedict XVI touched the mind. What Benedict XVI did in his brilliant papacy is remind us again of one of the fundamental uh, pieces of uh, ingredients of the Catholic recipe of 2,000 years, namely that reason and faith are not enemies at all, folks. Reason and faith are allies. This was the, the ancient uh, uh, insight of the fathers, uh, particularly of St. Anselm. This is the great insight of blessed John Henry Newman. Reason and faith are allies, all right? Reason is the greatest natural gift God gives us. Faith is the greatest supernatural gift he gives us. And strange would be the God who would have those two supreme gifts at, odd, at odds. Now, this is extraordinarily timely, everybody, in a world of the new atheism, where a secular culture on steroids attempts to reduce belief to a private hobby at best, or some silly oppressive superstition at worst. Benedict so beautifully, so poetically, so masterfully reminded us that reason itself the human mind shows us the truth and points to God. And when reason is in partnership with revelation and faith, this becomes liberating. This becomes affirming of all that is good and true and beautiful 
in the human project. He reminds us as well that the church is the engine of genuine human progress. And the church's rich intellectual tradition is hardly some museum piece, but as timely as they come. So Benedict would revive the intellectual wattage of the church. Think about some of the ways he did this. Let's look at what we call affirmative orthodoxy. That Benedict said the church is always about a ringing, resounding yes to everything that is good and decent, true and beautiful and noble in the human project. That contrary to his own caricature from which he suffers and contrary to the stereotype given the church, the Catholic Church is in the business of affirmation and saying yes to everything that is good, liberating, true, noble, and beautiful in the human project. The church only says no to something that negates everything that is good and noble in the human project. And I don't know about you, but as Benedict said, where he comes from, two no's make a yes. All right? So when the church says no to another no, she's still saying a yes. A second way would be in what your own Father Raymond has described as a September legacy in that, uh, in that pointed article he did in that splendid publication, Convivium. In those four talks, uh, where were they, Father? They were Regensburg and Paris and London and the Bundest Bundestag, correct? Where he, where he in, a, in, a, in an extraordinarily um, poetic way, and I would call it poetic, he would speak about the intellectual treasures of the church. It was from these talks, for instance, that things such as his interior ecology come from. Get this, listen, listen to this and how powerful it is. Benedict XVI says in one of these September talks, look, in fact, it was at the Bundestag, and he said, we all today know that we need to protect the environment. We all know that God has implanted in the environment and creation a logic, a coherence, a beauty, a balance, a choreography, and that to tamper with that, to ruin the environment, is tragic, it's toxic. At that stage, the Green Party stood up and gave him a standing ovation, and he kind of looked at him and smiled and said, yeah, well, listen to where I'm going with this one, all right? Because he said, just as there is a logic and a coherence, a law that must be in, uh, obeyed in the exterior environment, guess what? There's also one in the interior ecology. The way God has made us as a human being points to a, a law, a logic, a coordination, a choreography, a symphony that is deep within the human person, giving us a law that must be respected or else we turn in to a love canal or a three-mile island filled with toxins and dioxin and poisons within, just as we dread in the exterior world. Benedict would teach us in his September legacy to avoid the two extremes. You know what the two extremes are. Reason without faith becomes the dictatorship of relativism, as anything goes. And as the only guiding principle becomes what I want to do, when I do, want to do it, how I want to do it, with whom I want to do it, and wherever I want to do it, that's the only absolute in the world. There's reason without faith. And faith without reason becomes a shallow, superstitious fetism that will not hold up to the laudable scrutiny of the interior of the interior world. Benedict would point, using the words of blessed John Henry Newman, to this via media, this middle way where faith and reason are blended in a, in a Catholic wisdom that has sustained two millennia of culture, poetry, literature, science, universities, and education. This is the Benedict XVI that took shock pad pa paddles to the mind, to the brains of the church, and allowed us to hold our head high that this man, professor, teacher par excellence, could once again restore the intellectual credibility of the church. The lesson Benedict the 16th the restoration of the mind this clarity this clarity with which he speaks the lesson for this campus and for you blessed students on it is magnificent that we have nothing to fear of the truth 
And the truth will set us free, as Jesus himself said. And then when we take our studies seriously, when we take science seriously, when we take history and literature, when we take all of this, we are part of God's creation. And we learn of God. We learn of the creator as we learn of his creation. Benedict XVI in reason. And finally, our beloved Pope Francis. Um, it was a year ago, wasn't it, that Benedict XVI uh, left. I'll never forget it. I think, it's, I think it's a year tomorrow that the helicopter left and he went out to Castel Gandolfo. And, uh, and I remember being at, the, at the, uh, what we call the congregation, which was those almost two weeks of meetings before the actual conclave started in the Sistine. And I remember the first morning, the first morning we had a Franciscan preacher. Every morning we had about a 10-minute fervorino, a spiritual talk to the cardinals. And I remember the first morning the cardinal, or the uh, uh, Franciscan just looked out at us at the College of Cardinals, and he said, Your Eminence is one of you is going to be Pope, the next Pope. The Holy Spirit has already chosen who that will be. Your job is to find out who the Holy Spirit has chosen. Not a bad description of the process, was it? And I can see that's true now, the more that I come to know and love and respect uh, Pope Francis. Uh, the minute he chose his name, Francis, and you know, there, there we were in, in conclave. Um, we're not supposed to talk about the conclave. You already know, well, you know, I lost, for one, that was a, <laughs> but uh, that's no secret, okay? Um, but when, he, when, he, when he, he's asked, he says, I accept. When he was asked what name, he said, Francis. And right away, excuse me, Archbishop Prendergast, he said, of Assisi, not, uh, not uh, Xavier, all right? Because St. Francis Xavier, of course, is the great Jesuit missionary. Uh, Pope Francis reminded us, that he wanted to be named after the, the poor man of Assisi, St. Francis of Assisi. He, right off the beginning, we thought there's something, there's something touching, there's something tender, there's something different about this man, Jorge Bergoglio, uh, when he went into the, uh, what we call the Room of Tears to get vested. You know, that it's right off the Sistine Chapel and there's the three cassocks in there. There was a, uh, a small, medium, and large. When I didn't see an XXL, I knew I didn't have a chance anyway, right? But when he, when he came back out, the protocol was for all of us to line up and begin to go up and pay our allegiance to him. And he, he kind of stood in line to begin. And then all of a sudden, we saw him dart through the Sistine Chapel. And I, we thought, I wonder where he's going. And he had gone down, there was one, pope, one cardinal in a wheelchair and one cardinal on a walker. And he, he immediately went down to them. Now, folks, that's very ordinary, isn't it? That's simple, raw courtesy. But I don't have to tell you all that there's nothing ordinary about simple courtesy anymore, is there? And here is a man that has it spontaneously. As we began to go up, of course, the attendants by then were coming in, and there was conversation going on. We were asking the attendants as they come in, are there any people out in the square waiting, what, uh, how the smoke worked this time. And we said, how's the weather? And the word went around that it was raining. And you could see the Pope, he perked up and he said, he looked out at us, he said, look, we're going to have dinner together. I can meet you later. I don't want to keep those people waiting out in the square. So we went out there immediately. Now again, just a simple, ordinary, daily touching gesture, but it gets to the heart of a man. This is a pope who is restoring the heart of the church. This is a pope that's making charity a household word, as John Paul made solidarity a household word. This is a heart that breaks a tragedy. Think of Lampedusa when the boat carrying refugees from Africa sunk. Think of Syria. I met with uh, Syrian Orthodox bishops about a month ago. They are convinced that it was only because of Francis that further military intervention and escalation was kept uh, out of Syria because of his, fleas, his, his pleas. This is a heart that, like Jesus, goes out to those at the side of the road, urging all of us to get out of the sacristy, to cast out to the deep. This is a heart that tells us to be with our sheep, to smell like the sheep. This is a heart that encourages us to take risks 
and dare and not even be afraid of accidents. This is a heart that has a particular radar for the poor. I'm often reminded when I look at Francis of the ancient story about St. Elizabeth, uh, St. Lawrence, St. Lawrence, one of the great saints of Rome. And when the, when the, uh, the uh, Caesar, the emperor of Rome called him in and said, I want all the treasures, all the riches of the church in this courtyard within three days or I will unleash a persecution. And Lawrence came back three, three days later and the attendants went to the emperor and said, Lawrence is here. And the emperor said, are the riches or the treasures of the church with him? And they said, he says he's brought them. And when the, when the emperor went out, he sees the, the beggar and he sees the blind, and he sees the widow, and he sees the orphan, hundreds, thousands of them. And Lawrence said, this, this is the treasure. These are the riches of the church. This is a heart that is not afraid to be tender. Will you, will you ever forget his installation uh, sermon on the Feast of St. Joseph, March 19th, last year? Right afterwards, I, I can remember as, at the end of it, it was very brief, Another reason I liked him, okay, because he speaks very briefly. I was sitting next to one of the more brilliant men in the College of Cardinals, the Archbishop of, of Vienna, Christoph Cardinal Schornbrunn, who wrote the Catechism, a, a great intellectual. And he turned to me, and he had tears in his eyes, and he said, Tim, this man speaks like Jesus. And I said, Chris, I think that's the job description, all right? But... Do you remember, you remember what he said? And afterwards, I had a, uh, uh, an interview with a very renowned journalist, a woman journalist. If I'd say her name, you'd remember it, but I'm not because she, she spoke to me privately as a pastor. And she said to me, Cardinal Dolan, she said, I'm extraordinarily moved. She said, I just had to cover this installation mass. She said, in my job, I'm at wars, I'm at famines, I'm at plagues. I see violence and drugs and crimes. I see humanity at its worst. That's my beat, she said. And this man, this man speaks about tenderness. This man spoke about Joseph holding the baby Jesus and embracing his virgin wife. This man says we shouldn't be afraid to be tender with God, tender with ourselves, and tender with one another. This is a man who knows what Bernini's colonnades are all about. Those colonnades that reach out around St. Peter's Square and what Bernini said, these are the arms of Holy Mother Church that want to bring all the people closer to Jesus in and through this church, the church. This is a man with a heart who tells us that the church is not some NGO. It's not some cold clinical institution. It's not just some other organization with an agenda. It's just not an ethical society. This is a church that is really a person, Jesus Christ, who has a heart that we call the sacred heart. This is a church that is a family, that has the heart of a family, which is the sacred heart of Christ. To restore the heart, to restore the tenderness, to restore the luster of the church, perhaps, will be the driving mission statement of Pope Francis, because as you all know, we live in a culture that believes that Christ is fine, but the church forget about it. We'll take God as our father, as long as we're the only child. We'll take Christ as our shepherd, as long as we're the only sheep in the flock. We'll claim Jesus as our general, as long as it's a one-man army, all right? We want Christ without the church, and Francis reminds us over and over again that you can't have one without the other, that Jesus Christ and his church are one, and that we're part of a family. We're born into it. The church is our mother. The church is our family. We've got God as our father. We've got Jesus as our Lord and Savior, yes, but as our older brother. We've got Mary as our mother. We've got our, the saints as our brothers and sisters and what we call the communion of saints. Even on earth, we have a man we call our Holy Father. We have the sacraments that bring us together as a family. This family, by the way, can be dysfunctional because this church is always in need of reform. But with St. Peter and with St. Francis, while recognizing that the mystical body of Christ has tumors on it, 
while recognizing that our supernatural the ch the family, the church, is dysfunctional, this is a church about which we say what Peter said about Jesus, Lord, to whom else shall we go? You and you alone have the words of everlasting life. A pope with a heart. Now, students learn about the heart of Francis and learn how genuine and authentic it is. You see, I'm trying, like you are, after a year, to think, what is it about Francis that has so magnetized the world? What about his popularity? My Lord, did you ever think that the Pope would be on the cover of Rolling Stone? That's like me being on the cover of Men's Health. All right? um, I mean, it's just, it's, it, it just seems impossible, you know? But what is it, what is it that has touched this, this, this nerve? What is it that has touched this heart? And I would propose to you, it's his heart which is genuine and authentic. There's nothing staged. There's no marketing here. There's no strategy here. The world thinks there is. If you, um, Archbishop O'Brien, Archbishop Prendergast, can perhaps uh, Father Ray can all agree with me. When you meet with journalists, they think there is a strategy of marketing. Wow, who's ever advising him to pay his own hotel bill? Wow, they've got this because this is just what the church needed. He doesn't need that advice. There's no marketing there. There's no strategy. It comes from within. It is authentic. It is genuine. His faith is not spray painted on, okay? It's something that comes from deep within. It comes from his faith, which is, a, which is a theological virtue implanted in the heart and soul of the believer, like you and me, on the day of our baptism. This is about as deep down as you can get. This is as authentic and genuine as you can get. This is no frills. This is no artificiality. This is no staging. This is no strategy. And young, beloved young people on campus, for your peers to see you genuine and authentic. You're a Catholic, not just because you happen to have been raised in a Catholic family. Hallelujah if you were. What a tremendous boost that is, okay? But that's not the reason you're a genuine, authentic Catholic. It's because you got the gift of faith that you have accepted, you've internalized, and you're living a life of gratitude for that faith. This is Francis. This is a heart. And this is what, this is the charity that this great pope can teach us. Now, final word, everybody. I don't mean to imply that each, every pope has these. John Paul had a heart in abundance. Benedict uh, had a, a soul. A soul had in heart, clarity, uh, courage, and charity. All the popes have got them, all right? And these three that we're most familiar with have had them in, in spades. Um, so we never praise a given pope at the expense of another, which is a temptation today in, in praising Pope Francis. We realize, everybody, that the popes are a gift. I sometimes think that non-Catholics have a higher estimation and a deeper esteem and appreciation for the gift of the papacy that, than we do. We Catholics believe they are a gift. They are Peter. The world recognizes them more than we do. Remember George Bernard Shaw in his preface to St. Joan? Do you remember what he, what he wrote? Compared to our infallible democracies, our infallible doctors, our infallible scholars and scientists, our infallible judges and our infallible lawyers and our infallible governments. The Pope is on his knees in the dirt, confessing his ignorance before the throne of God, and in the end has more right to the claim than all the others combined. My brother Pat, my youngest brother, was there in the square. Uh, the year anniversary is coming is coming up, and he was there in the square, and, and I saw the interview that he gave. I was so proud of my brother. I didn't see it till a couple days later, and there's Patrick, uh, and he's being interviewed. By the, and first of all, he says, uh, he's, he said, you know, I, Patrick is 46, and he says, I'm the oldest guy in the square. 
because it was the hundreds of thousands of there were, were young people. And he said, you know when the greatest cheer went up was when the white smoke went up. He said, and it dawned on me, I'm looking around at these people ecstatic at the white smoke. We didn't know who the new pope was. We didn't know where he came from. We didn't know what languages he spoke. We didn't know if he was so-called liberal or conservative. We didn't know how old he was. We didn't know what name he was going to choose. And we didn't care, because all we knew is that we have a pope. And that's what causes us to cheer. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Uh, all right. And now, now in the words of the Roman liturgy, now there'll be a second collection, right? No. <laughs> Thank you all. I hope you know how proud I am to be here, how grateful, how thankful I am, not only for your... Uh, the inspiration you gave me, the warmth of your invitation, and your welcome. But boy, oh boy, the testimony that you give. I mean it. I come from New York. We got 2.8 million Catholics. I don't think we'd get a crowd like this to support our excellent campus ministry. I know we wouldn't, because I've tried. You got something special here in Kingston. You got something special at the Newman Center at Queens University. You got something special in your your archbishop, your priests and your deacons and your sisters, you got something special in Father Ray and the Catholic Christian outreach and what's going on at Newman and I'm proud to be part of it. Thank you.